Hey everyone, welcome to the part two on logical operations. Hey everyone, welcome to the part two of propositional logic where I'm going to keep on talking about logical operations. So last time we were talking about negation. Oh. So last time we were talking about negation. Hey everyone, welcome to the part two of propositional logic. Uh, last time we talked about operations such as negation, conjunction, and disjunction. And we're going to introduce a couple more logical operations today, some of the ones that are a little bit trickier to understand, so I really want to spend some time going over them. So the first one of those <clears throat> So the first one of those operations that I want to talk about is the conditional operation. So if we have propositions P and Q, like before, we're going to say that the conditional P arrow Q is the statement, if it is the case that P is true, then it is the case that Q is true, or if P, then Q. Now the thing about this, now the thing about this, so the thing about a conditional statement is that we are making a promise. So when I'm saying if P then Q, I'm saying that I promise if P is true, then Q will also be true. And if I happen to violate that promise, if P happens to be true, but Q ends up not being true, or in other words, Q is false, then this whole promise will be invalid. So what we're saying is we're setting up a promise. And we're trying to say, okay, well, if this promise is valid, if this promise works out, then the entire statement will be true. Otherwise, if the promise is violated in some way, the entire statement will be false. So for example, let's take a look at the natural numbers, which in a previous video we said were the set containing 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. We're going to have our statement p be equivalent to 1 is a natural number, and q will be equivalent to 1 plus 1 is a natural number. So given the fact that 1, we have explicitly said that 1 is a natural number, so this is going to be a true statement. Now q the statement 1 plus 1 is a natural number. Well, we know that this is true because the natural numbers are a discrete structure. They're a set where every element, like so, is separated by its neighbors by exactly 1. So 2 is 1 away from 1, and 2 is 1 away from 3. So because of this, we're saying that 1 is a natural number, and 1 plus 1, since 1 is a natural number, 1 is going to be 1 away from its neighbor, so this will also be a true statement. So if I promise that if 1 is a natural number, then 1 plus 1 is a natural number, that's going to be a true statement. We have not violated the promise because both P and Q are both true.
So as we just saw in the last example, if we have a P that is true and a Q that is true, then we have not violated our promise at all. So the promise if P then Q is completely true. However, we still need to figure out these other cases. And in order to do that, I have a few examples that we can build on to try to figure out what if P then Q will be when we look at these statements in particular. So if P then R, we're saying one is a natural number, which is true. If one is a natural number, then one plus 0 0.5 is a natural number. Now the problem is, is that one's neighbor, which is two, is the closest natural number greater than one. So basically, the closest natural number to one is one away from it, which must mean that one plus 0 0.5 cannot be a natural number. 1.5 is not in the natural numbers. And an easy check is just because it has a decimal point in it. So that's not going to work out. So this is actually going to be a false statement. Now down here, we're saying if P is a true statement, then R is a true statement. And we have that P is a true statement. So if our promise is correct, then we would expect R to be a true statement. But in this case, R is a false statement. So we have violated our promise. Therefore, this is going to be a false statement as well. Now for the next one, I want to take a look really quick at S, S's truth value here, 1.5 being a natural number. This is, of course, false for similar reasons discussed for R being false. So now what I want to do is I want to take a look at S implies P, or if S then P. And I also want to take a look at S implies R. So what this statement is saying is that if S is true, then P is true. Down here, we're saying if S is true, then R is true. So here's the thing. What our promise is saying is that if S happens to be true, then I am guaranteeing you that P is true. And that's all that a promise says. So what happens if S is false? Well, our promise doesn't say anything about what happens when S is false. So because we haven't really violated anything with the promise, the promise, remember, the promise only says that if this is true, then this is true, but this happens to be false. So we haven't even fulfilled the conditions for us to even consider the promise. So this actually is true because we haven't broken the promise per se. And similarly here, S happens to be false, so the promise doesn't really say anything about what, hap what happens when S is false. So this whole promise is true because we haven't broken that promise right at all. So really, the only way for us to violate the promise that if P then Q is for P to be true and Q to be false. That's a really important thing to remember because... It often trips up a lot of people. I know it took me a while to really figure it out before I finally get it, but what's helped me a lot and what seems to help a lot of students is thinking about it as a promise that you're trying to uphold or that you might have violated and what ways you could try to violate that promise that if P is true, then Q must be true. I should probably pause. Oh, wait. All right, so what I want to do now is actually point out some alternate forms of conditional statements. So if we let P and Q be propositions and we consider this the conditional statement, if P then Q, we can say that the converse of if P then Q is the statement if Q then P. The inverse of if P then Q is if not P then not Q. And we can assume that there's little parentheses around the not P and the not Q here. And the contrapositive of if P then Q is if not Q, 
than not p. And what, I want, what I want to do here is I have a pretty large truth table like this, and I want to explore sort of the similarities and the differences between a conditional statement and some of its alternate forms. So the converse, if q then p. What we know is that if both q and p are true, then this statement is going to be true. Also, we know that whenever q is false, based on what we talked about for the for the conditional statement being sort of like a promise, we can say that this whole statement we can say that this whole statement is true, my apologies, when q is false. And then finally, if we've made the promise that if q is true, then p is true, but we have q is true and p is false, the statement is going to look like this. And that brings us to a problem where if we're looking at if p then q and we're looking at if q then p together, we see that for one truth for one set of truth values, for p being true and q being false, if p then q is false, but if q then p is true. So we have this area where the outcomes of these two statements are not equivalent to each other for the same input values. We have another one of those instances down here. So what this can show us is that if p then q and if q then p are not equivalent statements because there are these two rows in the truth table where for these combinations of inputs and outputs. So what this tells us is that these two statements are not equivalent to each other because we have these two rows right here for where for these combination of combinations of inputs, the outputs of these two statements are completely different. So because of this, we can say that if P then Q and if Q then P are not equivalent. And the way we would write that is we would say that if P then Q, we draw our equivalency sign that we've been using and put a cross through it is not equivalent to if q then p. So for two logical, so for two propositional statements to be a, considered equivalent to each other, for us to say that some proposition is logically equivalent to another proposition, what that means is that for every single combination of any of the input values for those propositions, that they are that all of the that all of the rows of the truth tables are exactly the same. And the only way you can show that two propositions are not equivalent to each other, and this is really important, so I'll say it again. The only way you can show that two propositions are not equivalent to each other is if you look in the truth table and they have and there's at least is if you look in the truth table is if you look in the truth table and there's at least one row in the table where the outputs don't match. Now let's continue on with now let's continue on with the inverse statement. So now we're looking at if not p then not q. Well for not p to be true p is going to have to be false and for not q to be true q is going to have to be false. So what we can do is we can say well, not P is true. So then we know that if we want both not P and not Q to be true, that both P and Q will have to be false. So when P and Q are false, then we'll have if something that is true, then something that is true. So the whole statement will be true. Similarly, if not P is false, then our promise doesn't cover any of the scenarios that has to do. Similarly, if not p is false, similarly, if not p is false, then no matter what not q ends up being, our promise isn't violated because the promise only guarantees that if not p is true, then not q is false. So for not p to be false, or whenever p is true, we still know that the promise is completely valid. The only time our promise is not valid is when not p is true 
and not Q is false. Or in other words, when P is false and Q is true. And right here, we have two pieces of information. If P then Q is not equivalent to if not P then not Q. And we have that if Q then P is equivalent to if not P then not Q. Because if Q then P and if not P then not Q have the exact same truth tables. Because of this, we can say that they are logically equivalent because their output will always be the same for every possible combination of their inputs. Finally, I want to take a look at if not Q, then not P. So like before with, so like before with if not P, then not Q, we can look at when not Q is true and when not P is true, or when P and Q are both false. So we know that the statement is true then. We also know that the statement is true whenever not Q is false or whenever Q is true. So it will be true here and it will be true here. And that just leaves us with when Q is false and P is true or when not Q is true and P is false, which means that the whole promise there is false. And what that tells us here is that if P then Q is equivalent to if not Q, then not P. All right, now I want to talk about the last logical operator in this class. That will, I want to talk about the last. All right, so now we'll move on to the last logical operator that we'll talk about in this class, and that's the biconditional operator. So if we have P and Q be propositions as usual, then the biconditional statement, P if and only if Q, is the statement P is true if and only if Q is true. Now this one's a little bit hard to talk about, so let's think about this. Now this one's a little bit tricky, so let's try to break down the statement. We're saying that P happens to be true only when Q is true. So if Q is false, P will also be false. However, I want to note that this goes the other way around as well. So we can also say that Q is true if and only if P is true. So if P is false, then Q is also going to be false. Basically, we're saying that the only way P can be false is if Q is not true. So we're making another promise here. We're saying that So we're making another promise here. We're saying that P will only be true when Q is true and that P is false if Q is false. So if you look at the truth table here, true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false. And we're looking at P if and only if Q. Again, we're making the promise that the only time P will be true is when Q is true. So this, if we have P and Q both true, we have upheld our promise. If we have P and Q both false, we have also upheld our promise because we're saying, we're claiming that the only way for P to be false is if Q is false and the only way for Q to be false is if P is false. When we get here, this is where our promise starts to fall apart. If I'm saying you will only see P true with Q true, but only one of them is true and the other is false, then our promise is no longer valid. So that's when you get the statement being false.
So back on the topic of equivalencies, now that we have all of the operations under our belt, we can actually start talking about some equivalencies that will make our life a little bit easier. So if I want to say, if I want to ask, so if I was to ask on homework or a test or something like that, is if P then Q equivalent to, let's say, not P or Q. So here I'm raising the question, is this equivalency true or is this actually not an equivalency? What you want to do is you want to draw out a truth table. And you're going to start out with So given that this is a truth table, you're going to have all of so given that this is a truth table, you're going to have all of your propositional input values like this. And something that helps me is if I sort of take things, I guess you could say one step at a time. What I mean by that is first off, I'm going to just look at not P. Because right here, we have this not P as part of this equation. So what I want to do is actually is so what I want to do is explicitly lay out what not P is because it'll make it a lot easier for me to deal with this part of the equation here. So not P, well, when P is true, not P is false. And when P is false, not P is true. And now after this, I'm going to start looking at not P or Q. So remember that we have a disjunction right here, which means that if one of these two is true, then the whole statement is true. So we have true or false is true, false or false is false, true, so true, and we see a true here, so that's also true. And as we described before, we have if P then Q, which we talked about being true, false, true, true. So because these truth tables are exactly the same, we know that if P then Q is logically equivalent to if not P. So then we know that if P then Q is logically equivalent to not P or Q. And this is actually a really important equivalency. We call this the conjunction. This is actually a pretty important equivalency. We call this the conditional disjunction equivalency, or CDE. And I do want you to remember the name of this because we'll be applying this equivalency quite a bit in the future. So just keep that in mind. So another example we can look at is P if and only if Q, checking if that's equivalent to if P then Q and if Q then P. So again, we're going to do this through a truth table. True, false, true, false, true, true, false, false. First off, what I want to look at is if P, then Q. So that's going to be true, false, true, true, as we saw before. Then I want to look at if Q, then P. This will be true, true, false, true. And now I want to end them together. And with an and, we know that if at least one of these two is false, then the entire statement will be false. So what I'm going to do really quick is I'm going to call this R and I'm going to call this S. 
The reason why I want to do that is because then I can just write R and S and it'll save me a little bit of room on my paper. And that's totally fine for us to do. So let's see, R is true here and S is true. So in this case, R and S is true. We have R, that R is false here, so the whole thing must be false. We have that S is false here, so the whole thing must also be false. And then we have that both are true, so this is true as well. And now I want to look at if P, or sorry, I want to look at P if and only if Q. And as we saw just minute, just a few minutes ago, that will be true, false, false, true. So we have that both of these statements are exactly the same, which means that this is equivalent. So the logical equivalency, P if and only if Q, is equivalent to if P then Q and if Q then P. This equivalency also has a name. We call it the biconditional conjunction equivalency. or B, C, E. And this is another one that I'll actually expect you to remember the name of. Uh, the B, C, E and the C, D, E will actually be on our midterm in a way. I'll show you how they'll show up in a sec. So I do want you to remember them for the midterm. Remember the name and what they mean. So now I want to introduce a couple more equivalencies. Uh, and if you are a computer engineer, certainly this uh, name will be familiar to you. So this is, these are De Morgan's laws for propositions. So we're going to let P and Q be propositions. Say that the negation of P and Q is equivalent to not P or not Q. And the negation of P or Q is equivalent to not P and not Q. I'm actually going to ask you all to prove why these are true in the homework, and you'll want to do that by using a truth table like we've done in this episode. And you'll want to do that by using a truth table like we've done in this video. All right, now you'll notice that All right, so this next problem, I want you to show another equivalency. In this case, I want you to show the negation of if P then Q is equivalent to P and not Q, but I want you to do it without truth tables. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to rely on previous equivalencies that we have shown, basically to show that these are equivalent. So the way we can do that is we can start with the negation of P, if P then Q and what I would recommend is whenever you're trying to show an equivalency without truth tables and you see a conditional or biconditional arrow, I highly recommend that you try to get rid of it immediately. So if you think back to the condition to the uh, conditional disjunction equivalency, wherever that might be, So if you think back to the conditional disjunction equivalency, where we say that if P then Q is equivalent to if not, not P or Q, so we can substitute that in right now, not, not P or Q. And what I want you to do when you're working on problems like this is I want you to cite what equivalency you use in order to show that, yes, this is actually a valid substitution to make because of the conditional disjunction equivalency. Now I've used the acronym here and that's totally fine, but I do want you to actually cite the equivalency. Now when I'm grading your work, part of it will actually be graded on how well you justify the claims that you're making. So if you make this claim here and you don't tell me that you use the conditional disjunction equivalency, I'll actually mark points off because it's important for you to cite your work, to tell 
whatever reader or whatever, whoever is looking over your shoulder, anything like that, you want to tell people why you can say what you're saying is correct. And this is extremely important. Uh, you might be going into the more academic side of things if you're doing research. And you always want to be able to prove pe to people, hey, this is why the claims that I'm making are correct. Or you might be going into industry, you might have a nice cushy job, but you still want to justify, well, yes, my code is correct because of these reasons. And we'll actually talk more about the actual proving how code is correct near the end of the quarter. And there will also be a conversation well into CSC 349 if you happen to take that. But basically, you have to be able to justify your reasoning. And if you don't, you will get marked off on your homework and tests. Now, the benchmark I like to, sh I like to use for whether you've done enough justification is I want to imagine that you're helping a classmate out with this problem. They have all the prerequisite knowledge needed for this class, but they're having trouble on this specific problem. Then you need to be able to say, well, this statement is equivalent to this statement, and I know this because of the conditional disjunction equivalency. So if you can add enough justification to help some potential random student out with this question without them having to ask any further questions, then you've done enough justification for this class. So now what we have is we have the negation of some kind of disjunction. So what I'll do is we can actually apply De Morgan's law. So this will end up being the negation of, in this case, the negation of P and the negation of Q. In sight, De Morgan's. And now what I want to do is I want to get rid of this double negative here. And it occurs to me that I completely forgot to show you the equivalency that will make this happen. So I want to display that right now. If you look at this truth table here for when P is true or false, not P is false or true, and then not, not P is going to be true or false. So we call this the double negation equivalency. That's another one that I want you to remember in the future. So we can actually apply double negative here to say that this is equal to P and not Q by double negative. And just like that, we have shown that the negation of if P then Q is equivalent to P and not Q, only using equivalencies that we've previously established. So it makes it a lot easier to work on some of these problems. Are you paused? Right. Here's the last example I want to show before we are finished with propositional logic. Now, what we have is a question of, now what we have is I want you to show that this statement is not equivalent to the statement. And I want to stress that the only way that you can show this, that is that you can show that two statements are not equivalent is through a truth table. That has tripped up a lot of people in the past, and there's a good chance that it might trip up some of you again. So please, please, please put it in your notes, double underline it, do whatever you have to do to show, to tell yourself that whenever you want to show that two statements are not equivalent, you have to use a truth table. So in this case, we have a three variable truth table. So we'll set it up like we did before. True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false, true, 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 false, 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 false. And if you sort of follow this pattern, it actually gives you every single combination of values for our propositional inputs. Now what I'll do first is I'll look at if P then Q. So this will be true, true, false, false, true, 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 true. If P then Q implies R. So now this will be 
true, if true, then true is true. If true, then false is false. True, true. If true, then true. If true, then false is false. True and false. Now, I want to look at if Q, then R. So this will be true, false, true, 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 false, true, true. And then taking P implies if Q, then R. For the first four, we have P is true, so that will be if true, then true is true, if true, then false is false, if true, then true is true, if true, then true is true. Now we have all falses here, which means that all of these are going to be true. So what we now need to do is we need to compare this column and this column. So if we look, we can see that in this row and in this row there, there is a difference between this column and this column. So there's at least one set of propositional inputs where the outputs are completely different. So we can, just by knowing this, we can say that, okay, well, these cannot be equivalent because of this one difference here. In fact, there's actually two differences. So super not equivalent. All right. And that's it. Uh, all right. And that's it for propositional logic. So this will be everything that's covered on the homeworks and I will see you all in class.